Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Politics and Media Show with me, Salma Yaqub. On tonight's show, we'll be discussing a very important yet rarely discussed subject within the Muslim community, that of mental health. We'll be tackling the subject in the light of some very damning criticisms of the general state of Britain's mental health care services. The comments were made last week by Professor Dinesh Bugra, the outgoing president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who said widespread failures in inpatient care for mentally ill people meant that many hospital wards did not meet acceptable standards and discharged sick, sick people back into society who remained a risk to themselves and others. He was also critical of what he described as overcrowded and understaffed psychiatric wards, which are leaving patients fearful for their safety and unable to make proper recoveries. Now, to discuss this and services on offer to Muslims in particular, we have in the studio with us Polly Falconer, who is Head of Mental Health and Training at the Afia Trust, which is a charity that works to reduce inequalities in health and social care provision for people from minority communities. Polly is also a member of the government's Joint Commission Panel for Mental Health. Welcome to the programme. Thank you for taking the time out. Very nice to be here. And with us in the studio, we're also joined by Aisha Aslam, who is a psychotherapist. She founded Sukoon Muslim Counselling Services. Thank you very much for coming in today, Aisha. Oh, thank you. And on the line we have with us tonight, Abdullah Maynard, who is chair of the Latif Project, which offers a phone line for Muslims and people related to the Muslim community in Birmingham. He's developed and, develop and delivers Islamic counselling courses as well. Welcome, Abdullah. Asalaamu Alaikum, Abdullah. Thank you for joining us. I hope Abdullah can hear us on the line. Uh, if there's any problems, we'll get that sorted out. We did. We did invite uh, the Care Services Minister Paul Burst out to appear, but he was unable to make it. And later on, we read out a statement from the government on the issue. But if we can turn to you first, Polly. What do you make of the criticisms, the pretty severe criticisms of Britain's mental health service? They are, and, and they're not an uncommon criticism. Um, in my experience, sadly, it's still very much a postcode lottery. And it really shouldn't matter where what you live. What does that mean, postcode? It means lottery. that the type and, and and the level of service and the quality of service that you get can depend on the area that you live in. So, for example. So, for example, um, that in, if you're in inner city London, you may find yourself more likely to be found in an overcrowded ward, whereas if you're in perhaps a smaller rural community. The facilities may be more modern, there may be more funding made available. And why, by... why is that? That's because the decisions are made by the local, at the moment, primary care trust mm -hmm. commission services, and we, we know that that's going to be changing. And, and so it really depends on the priorities for that particular area. Um, so, and of how much money each area has. And it's just a sad fact that it can really depend on where you live. Hence the term postcode lottery. Abdullah, um, I hope you can hear us. Yes, what, I can. What's been your response to the criticism? These are coming from quite high up. This is a, a outgoing president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists who, who is severely criticising Britain's mental health services. Is that your experience in delivering care that there is a problem? I'm not surprised by the criticism in a way because the mental health services have strategically always been lacking in relation to priorities within health as a whole. I think what's more critical is not just the issue about the ability for secondary care to actually enable people to actually recover and enable people to do that in wards which aren't overcrowded. But I think the whole, I think it's time that we took a real look at mental health, not just in terms of secondary care, but primary care. Because to me, one of the more concerning factors is whether or not we're able to actually do the early interventions to actually enable people to have a better, to enable people to basically be well without even necessarily going to overcrowded wards. Well, is this the government's job or is it the community's job? Well, I would always say that it's a combination, but I think that what's lacking is the strategic lead by government. Well, we'll come back on to the government's response. We mentioned you're on the uh, commissioning panel. We'll, we'll come on to But I can ask, uh, Aisha, you set up a, a counselling service. Presumably, you felt there was a gap in, in provision. Definitely, there is a gap in 
in, you know, in this area. If we look at um, when NHS was set up 50 years ago, it initially just um, focused upon the Western population and it also just purely looked at physical health problems. However, as time has gone by, it has realised that mental health is important, such as psychological and psychiatric problems. In addition to that, also religious and cultural factors do have an impact upon mental health issues. However, there is room for improvement in that area. And um, like Polly has mentioned about funding cuts as well, you know, this is, funding is happening, um, cuts are happening in funding. Um, and it's at a time where people are stressed, they're anxious, they're losing their jobs, their homes. Um, and it might be beneficial in the short term. However, it's, you know, it's um, failing to support mental health mm -hmm. problems, you know. So you um, think it's going to get worse because of the economic situation? Yes, economic, social and human burdens in the future. So it is causing a lot of problems. Um, well, maybe this is, would be a good time to actually read out uh, the government's statement, as we mentioned, the care service minister, Paul Burstow, was invited to appear in the programme but was unable to make it. Uh, but I will now read out a statement by the Department of Health on this issue. I quote, we published No Health Without Mental Health, our cross-government mental health outcome strategy, to drive up standards in services and improve the nation's mental health. The strategy makes clear that mental health services should be just as important as physical health services such as those for cancer and heart disease. We have supported the Royal Colleges of GPs and psychiatrists to develop advice and support for commissioning consortia to commission effective mental health services. The strategy emphasises the importance of improving quality and productivity across the system whilst making efficiency savings that can be reinvested in the service to deliver quality improvements. In addition, we will invest around £400 million over four years in psychological therapies for those who need them in all parts of England, expanding provision for the entire population. If I can uh, come back to Abdullah, uh, we're hearing in that government statement mention of efficiency savings, which most people understand to be cuts, is at the same time claiming that £400 million extra will be put in the system. So are you taking that as good news or bad news? I'm taking that as a mixed uh, message in that what really hasn't happened here is a critical evaluation of need in relation to mental health. We've got a wonderful strategy, IAPS. Yes, it's brilliant that an additional 400 million is actually going into provision of service, and that's not being limited to people of a working age. But I think what's, what's not clear here is that the complexity of presentation, the complexity of problems that people are, are actually having, don't necessarily meet the IAPS. Provisions criteria. Uh, what's IAP? Just remind our, our viewers. Okay, so this government, like the previous government, is committed to a program of increasing access to psychological therapies, IAP. Mm -hmm. They're using an evidence based analysis which has very, very heavily come behind the idea of cognitive therapies as being effective in relation to depression and in relation to anxiety. There is evidence to support this. However, the majority of evidence that's actually available has been in relation to uh, white Europeans. Um, there is a lack of evidence in regards to uh, black and ethnic minority communities. Now, this is understandable if you're taking a very secular look at what mental health is. But if you understand that mental health also relates to spiritual well-being as well as emotional well-being, if you factor in, for example, the information for the last census, which indicates that 97% of people from BME communities have a faith um, which, they, which they practice in some way, and if that faith actually makes sense of their world and their life experience, coming to enable people who are going through mental or emotional distress with a model which doesn't actually take into consideration the things that they understand and the things that they believe, mm -hmm. it's going to have limitations. 